I have a question for you. How do you make a patch for one of these? Yes, that sounds like a completely ridiculous question, but that's the exact problem that the developers of Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal faced near on 20 years ago, when they realized that the first multiplayer game they had ever released had no way to be updated or patched. Not only that, the console that they released it on, at least in some models, had no mechanism for installing and maintaining these patches. It's common practice now, but why couldn't you install updates on this compared to this? No, seriously, that may seem like an obvious question, but unless you're in the field of computer science in some capacity, your answer's probably gonna be because it's older. Which is technically true, but not entirely helpful. The answer becomes fairly obvious once you realise that the PlayStation 2 did actually have a number of updates written for games on the platform, which was only possible on original model PS2s with an installed hard drive. So there we go, modern consoles have drives in them, old ones didn't, so no patch. Also again, that is technically true and a little more helpful, but what was interesting is that this patch wasn't actually restricted to the original model PlayStation 2s, it could run on slims as well. That means there's something we're missing here. So, our first question. Why can't we, normally, install updates and patches onto old consoles without drives? To explain that, I'll need to explain first what computer memory is. I mean, it's not like there's a, a brain in there, so what the fuck does that mean? What is a computer's memory? If you're unfamiliar with the inner workings of these rust boxes, your first instinct is probably the hard drive, the SSD, you know, the place that your data lives on the computer, what I'm going to refer to as storage for the sake of simplicity. I mean, it is what a computer uses to remember data, but that's actually not what memory is. Memory is actually something that stores data for a much smaller amount of time than your various forms of drive. Think of it as short-term storage, it's essentially where software lives when it's running. Software, like games, is effectively just a set of instructions, and assets the instructions can do stuff with. To use terms you're more familiar with, that's what RAM is, and it exists because storage isn't fast enough to run software. Now we could get into stuff like direct drive for texture streaming, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole, so for the sake of simplicity, it's safe to assume that storage is too slow to stream things like textures in real time, or constantly be writing to a huge amount of different addresses in random locations. So we have this extra set of data storage that's attached to the computer. It's super fast, but not nearly as big because it's a lot more expensive, and software will be loaded from storage into memory when it needs to be run. Say if you switch levels in a game, the process of loading is copying all the level data, geometry and texture data and enemy info and stuff like that, from the storage of the hard drive you've installed the game on, or say, a DVD, into memory. The important thing to note about memory for our purposes is that it's what's known as volatile memory. What that means is, unlike storage, it can't persist data. Once you turn it off, the data is wiped, so memory is only good for storing things that the program needs right now, and is safe to not exist when the device restarts. Whether that's because it's state that doesn't need to persist across sessions, or because it's static data that can be copied into memory from more permanent forms of storage. That's why storage is required for game updates and patches, unless you want to download the patch every single time you start the game. In the modern day, with patches sometimes being equal in size to entire games in their own right, you can see how this is a problem, but if you're only fixing a couple of minor bugs, you might be able to get away with it. Or, at least, that's what the engineering team behind Up Your Arsenal's multiplayer thought, because that's what they did. Okay, now we can finally explain the patch proper. It's important to note though that we don't have footage of the patch actually running, nor do we know exactly what it did. We only know the mechanism that they used to achieve it. That mechanism, as revealed by an old Insomniac employee, was effectively them hacking into their own game, and like all hacks, the first thing they needed was a place where they could send in the new code from, an entry point. Luckily for them, they had one. Every time a player connected to the online servers, an EULA, the End User License Agreement, that thing you never read, was shown. That bit of text wasn't stored in the game itself, it was actually sent in from the online servers every time you connected. But how does that actually help them? They can send in new code, but wouldn't that just be displayed as text on screen rather than executed? 
Well, yes, that is true, but what they did is utilize a very basic and well-known exploit, a buffer overflow. For a bit of context, in programming languages like C++, which was what was used to develop these games, you have to specify the length of variables that are going to contain text. So, for example, I have this uh, string here that's called EULA, which I specified to be 16 characters long. So what that means is that the computer is going to go in and it's going to allocate 16 bytes of memory to store that. So that's because each character is one byte, so you get 16 bytes. And we see here we have the text of there, hello there, which is not quite 16 characters, but because we've specified the length, the computer is going to go in and allocate 16 bytes anyway. So if we have a look at a memory map of this, you can see we have a bunch of miscellaneous data in here and stuff, but you can see here we have the text hello there, which starts here. So we have hello there. And then you can see we have this, this extra data here that adds up to be 16 bytes. And if we say, said that that was 32 instead of 16, and we run this again, you'll see that we now have a bunch more space here because the computer's gone and allocated twice as much memory for this variable. Now, what's important about this is that in modern programming languages, and even like modern versions of C++, and even in a lot of cases, old, the old versions of C++ wouldn't have let you do stuff like this either. But the point is, is that you can't allocate past this memory. If I try and do more than the 32 now, that's, that's uh, we've said, we'll see we're, we're already getting errors in the thing. Um, this is just um, IDE errors. And even if we try and build this, you'll see we'll, we'll get errors. What would be unfortunate, but actually ended up being very fortunate for them, the code that displayed this EULA used the old C function string copy, which does exactly what it says. It copies a string into a new location, and unlike the modern versions of this function, it has absolutely zero checks for memory size. So what happens when you use string copy to copy a string that's larger than the variable you're trying to copy it into is that it'll happily barrel past the assigned memory location for that variable and overwrite whatever's stored in memory that happens to be thereafter. That could be code instructions, it could be game assets, or anything in between, really. This most often just causes a crash, but in this specific case, where the programmers know exactly what memory they're about to corrupt, they can use that to their advantage and that's their entry point. When the game requests the EULA string from the server, it sends that text, yes, but it also sends a whole heap of other data attached to that text that gets overflowed into memory in a very specific way that allows them to execute the patch. So what is this data that they overflowed into memory? Well, it contains a couple of things. First, a bunch of miscellaneous data to pad out the length of the message. We'll see why this is necessary shortly. Then after that was the payload code itself. And finally was a pointer to where the start of the payload code is in memory. This is the reason for the miscellaneous data, because the message needed to be padded out so that the pointer was overwritten in a specific place in memory, which was a known function callback handler for a network packet. If none of those words made sense to you, I'll just explain what the effect of this is. With all the data now overflowed into memory, the server could send that specific network packet to the game, which would cause it to start executing the instructions that were pointed to in the callback handler, which was just overwritten to be the start of the payload code. That's it really. At this point, the patch starts executing. The only thing to worry about is the tiny issue of all the corrupted memory they just made. Remember how I said buffer overflows are usually caused crashes? Well, that's probably exactly what would happen if they left all this miscellaneous data in there. That's why the first part of the patch code wasn't actually the patch itself, but instead code that cleaned up all of the overwritten data before anything bad could happen. Once that was done, the patch could be executed without worry. Can I just take a minute to say, is that not fucking insane? Insomniac utilized an internally known exploit to live patch their game every time a player connected to their online servers. That is some wild shit that is on one hand very impressive, and on the other hand, whack as fuck. As a developer, your goal is to write the best code you can, the most maintainable, the most performant, readable, scalable, you know, whatever. And in fairness, I'm a web developer, maybe my opinion doesn't matter, but this is the kind of programming that I love. Well, it's not even just programming, it's the kind of solution to any problem that I love. The well thought out, complicated, and impressive bodge. It's the kind of solution that's really talked about, 
Go to any resource on the subject, whether that be textbooks or YouTube tutorials, and it's all about best practices, amazing solutions, and while that is fair and I don't think we should be teaching people how to write overly complicated and hacky solutions like this, it does ignore the fact that nothing is actually perfect. I may go into a ticket thinking I'm going to write the best code I possibly can, but by the end I've patched old jQuery into new React components using JavaScript events bound by use effect hooks. That's why I love hearing about solutions like this, in any space, because it pulls back the curtain to show the real people that put in the work to make these things. It tells a story, even if small, about the many complicated human factors that result in something like this. The fact that I find this so intriguing should not be a surprise if you've watched any of my previous work. The point is, next time you're bodging some shit together, just try and remember, it's okay. You're not the first, and you will not be the last. And what's most important at the end of the day, is that whatever you're making, works. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, baby. That's a wrap on this shit video.